Welcome to the book of Ephesians now, continuing our look at Paul's letter to these churches in Asia Minor. Let's go uh, in prayer for a moment first and just ask that the Lord would be wisdom to us and guide us. Father, this morning we ask that you'd make this book live to us. It is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. And uh, this morning as we consider your revelation of yourself to us, the, this mystery of the Lord Jesus Christ, we, we pray that this, the spirit that is given by the wisdom Sorry, the wisdom that's given by the Spirit of God may, may work in our lives and uh, may help us to understand rightly what you've said, uh, that we may be convicted and comforted and encouraged and challenged, Father, uh, to view the Lord Jesus Christ as your sole provision for the salvation of your people. Uh, grant us understanding now, we pray, uh, for the sake of the glory of Jesus and of your holy name. Amen. We've been dealing here with, with God's uh, giant Superfund project, the, the reclamation of what belongs to God, uh, this reclamation of accomplished through the gospel. And we've been looking at Ephesians 1 and um, working our way carefully through this, this introductory sentence, which really goes from verse 3 all the way to verse 14. And now we're looking at this section from 7 to 10. We'll take a moment here and read God's word. And in particular, we're looking this morning, uh, as we've looked at uh, this gospel reclamation project we're calling it, this, this God changing natural conditions from something that are unsuitable to something that is suitable for his glory and for his use. When we, when we do environmental reclamation projects, we take areas that are, that are unsuitable for one reason or another, pollution or, or They've been overcome with water and we rebuild and we make new. We take some natural condition that is not suitable and not helpful and we make it suitable. And through the gospel, God is undergoing this giant reclamation project. And we looked at his redemption in verse 7, the remission through this forgiveness in verse 7. And now this morning, we're going to focus on verses 8 and 9 uh, in this revelation. So let's read now God's word. Ephesians 1 verse 7 says, In him, that being in the beloved from the previous verse, that is Christ, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him things in heaven, and things on earth. Well, as I've said here, we just got done looking at this redemption, this remission, and we saw last time that this is according to the riches of His grace, not out of the riches of His grace, not just to meet our need. This is not the billionaire who buys a hungry man a meal. This is the billionaire who makes that hungry man an inheritance of all of his billions, and that God surpasses and superabounds to us in His grace. And today we want to consider this revelation of God to his people that you see there in verse 8 and 9. In all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ. You know, there's a lot of people who enjoy a good whodunit, a good mystery story. And a good portion of those people, I'd wager, uh, I'm probably one of them, they're drawn to these mystery stories because they enjoy the challenge of trying to figure it out, especially trying to figure it out before you get to the end. Uh, before you get to the big reveal to been able to say, you know, I called that. I knew who I knew it was him before they said it was him. And uh, they take great pride in making the use of even the smallest little clue. Like I noticed, you know, there was that purple book on the bookshelf and that was a clue for this and the other. And sometimes we go horribly awry. But the idea that we could best Sherlock's homes, right, that, that we could see all of the clues and put them in the right place and figure it out before we get to the big reveal. And Paul here, as he is extolling the glory of God and his gracious redemption of sinners, he mentions that God has made a mystery known to his people. This mystery concerns probably one of the most sought after uh, topics of wisdom and understanding in all of creation, that being the mystery of God's will. What is God's will? People want to know, what is, what is God's will for my life? And uh, we, we talk about, well, that must be God's will, or is this God's will? And we want to know. We're told we ought to know what God's will is. 
And we've already been told of a number of these spiritual blessings from verse 3, that God has given us in Christ every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. And we've seen many of these already as we've gone through this passage. But these have been given to the believer graciously in Christ. When we get here to verse 8 and 9, it's like every time we get to a new verse and we get to a new blessing, it's like hearing Paul say, but wait, there's more. And here it is. There's more. It's not enough that we've been chosen and adopted as sons and daughters and we've been forgiven and made a part of this family. There's more. And God doesn't wait to the end like Agatha Christie or or Arthur Conan Doyle, to reveal the purpose of his plan of redemption. This this revelation of his great mystery, in fact, has ushered in this last days. Since Christ's death, burial, resurrection, and ascension, the gospel writers of the New Testament tell us that we're in the last days. It's been the last days since Jesus ascended into heaven. And God's made it known then. That was 2,000 years ago. And as you look at verse 8 and 9, There are just three things, really, that I want us to see about God's revelation of this mystery, his unfolding of his purposes. First of all, we're going to have to deal with the fact that verse 8, I could tell you that I I read more about this one verse than than some of the other things that we've gone up to this point as much as I've read, uh, because there are really two ways of looking at verse 8, especially the second part of verse 8, this all wisdom and insight. And I can tell you that throughout all of Christendom, there are good and faithful Bible teacher and commentators, and they're just really two camps. And it's not an angry discussion. It's not a debate that's, that's heated because they're worried that the other side is misrepresenting something. They're just really two ways of seeing verse 8. Um, and it's kind of split right down the middle. And so we're going to have to deal with that. And I'll leave you to figure that out as you read the Scripture and study the Scripture and pray. Um, But we're going to see that there are two ways of looking at that. And I think the applications then that come after apply really to both. But we're going to have to deal also with the nature of this mystery. Just what exactly is this mystery that's been revealed? And that'll help us understand maybe what he's saying. And then there are really three points of application to to ourselves and our personal walk, to how we evangelize the lost world, and to how we deal with ministry inside the church and encourage one another. So first of all, let's just deal with verse 8. This wisdom and insight. Now, <clears throat> I'm no Greek scholar, and I'll be the first one to admit that to you. But a lot of the, the punctuation that we've included here is, is ours to help us understand, because really, in the Greek, Paul just kind of threw out all grammar. He's just so overwhelmed with the praise of God for what he's done here in his sovereign grace that we've had to add some, some commas and some periods to be able to make sense out of it. <clears throat> and in the ESV, there's this comma in verse... Um, uh, nine, right? So, sorry, in verse eight, uh, there's a comma before verse eight, according to the rich of his grace, which he lavished upon us. And then we've inserted this, this comma, right? In all wisdom and insight, making known to us. And so we have to deal with this. The, the disagreement really is this. There are really two ways of, of looking at this. One, that this wisdom and insight uh, is God's. It's God's wisdom, God's insight, all his wisdom and insight uh, by which he lavished his grace upon us. And that's what Paul is saying. That it, that it was in God's supreme wisdom and his supreme insight that he chose to be gracious to us to this degree, to redeem us. Or it's rather that Paul is saying that in God's lavishing of his grace upon us, that one of the things that God lavished upon us in grace was the wisdom and insight to know the Lord Jesus Christ, to know what this mystery was. And so we would connect the wisdom and the insight not to God, who's lavishing his grace, but as one of those things which God uh, graced to us, and it belongs to the having made known the mystery of his purpose. Six of one, half a dozen of another, right? You really can't go wrong. We'll have to deal with this. And part of the problem, uh, what makes this tricky, is that the scripture does teach teach both of these things in other places. In other words, no matter which way you go with this, you're going to be right. God already teaches both of those things separately in other places to be true. Both that God is infinitely wise, has all wisdom and insight, and it's that wisdom and insight by which he does, by which he does what he does. He also teaches in Scripture that God gives us wisdom. God gives us insight to make known who Christ is, what Christ has done, what God is doing. 
As a matter of fact, God teaches both of those things right here in this letter. Look at verse 17 in chapter 1. I'll back up to 16 so we can kind of get a feel for what Paul is saying here. In 16, Paul says, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and a revelation in the knowledge of him. This is something Paul is praying for. We've seen this in a number of other places. I could take you to a lot of places. Colossians especially. Verses, uh, in chapter 1 of Colossians, in verse 9, we've talked about that before. And in verse 28, this wisdom from God to man to know the Lord Jesus Christ. It requires an act of God that we would know who Jesus is in truth. We'll deal with that. Paul's also telling us here that all wisdom and insight belong to God. Look at chapter 3, verse 10. Matter of fact, if you go to verse 5, 4 and 5, when you read this, you could perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has been now revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. So it has been revealed. That's God giving knowledge to men. But then in verse 10, so that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might be made known. There you kind of have both, right? The wisdom belongs to God, but it's also made known to the church. So you really can't go wrong Either way, you do this, but we want to try to get at what, what Paul is saying here in the first chapter. I don't know which one is intended here for certain, and I'm going to leave that to you faithful believers to continue to search the Scriptures, to continue to pray, to continue to Bible study and to talk with one another and to have conversations about these things. But I think as we begin to try and land somewhere or to just understand this, we're going to have to go to the second point and then maybe come back. And the second point is, what is this mystery to begin with that God has made known to the church? What is it that God, that God did that he let us know about? What is it that I'm supposed to know for the test, right? That's what students always want to know, right? What do I have to know for the test? Yeah, I hear you talking about lots of stuff. I just want to know what the main idea is. What are you going to ask me about? So first of all, this, this mystery here, whatever wisdom and insight are involved here, whether God's or man's as given to him by God, it concerns this mystery. This wisdom is about this mystery. Verse 9 then informs us that the mystery revealed concerns Jesus, his work of redemption. You see there, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ, or some would say, some translations say, set forth in himself. Now this is confirmed in a lot of other places, so I want to go back and, and we'll remember this mystery that Christ himself began to do this. We think about the road to Emmaus and how Luke in, in chapter 24 talks about how Jesus, when he was speaking to these people, went back to Moses and the prophets and for all the Old Testament unraveled and revealed to them how Moses and the prophets, how the Old Testament was speaking about Jesus Christ. That God had given some knowledge, some revelation, ultimately, of Jesus all through the Old Testament. And that we're told that Jesus opened their minds to the Scriptures, that it was a work of God that they should understand what God had been saying all along. That what God had been saying all along was in pointing to Jesus Christ. So go back there, and let's just look at what Paul said in this third chapter, because he's praising God for all of this, and then he's going to come back through as he goes through the letter to the Ephesians. He's going to make this more clear. So let's just look at what he says there in its entirety in Ephesians 3. For this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner for Christ, Jesus, on behalf of you Gentiles, assuming that you've heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation, as I've written briefly. So, maybe he's talking about what he just said here. right? I, I told you that I've written about this mystery that was revealed to me. So maybe, maybe this wisdom and insight that he was mentioning in verse uh, 8 of chapter 1 was this. It's God revealing this mystery that helps us maybe unravel this. Verse 4, when you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. This mystery is, okay, so here it is, right? What's the mystery? Here he's going to say, this mystery is, what is it? That the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise 
in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Of this gospel, I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given to me by the working of his power. To me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things so that through the church the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was according to the eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord. The wisdom is God's. It's always been God's. It's an eternal plan and purpose. But now it is coming to us through the Lord Jesus Christ and through the church. God's going to make this known in all creation. What is he making known? That God's plan of redemption is focused upon Christ. And that it's not just for Jews. It is for all the world. It's for Gentiles. In this day and age, there are really only two categories of people, earthly in an earthly sense, there were Jews and there were not Jews or Gentiles. That's the only real categories that these people thought. And there are Jews and there are Gentiles. And the mystery was, even though we're going to see, and if you, if you go back into the Old Testament, I could tell you there's a number of places. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to have time to go through them all. We saw that Jesus was able to do that through Moses and the, and the prophets. All the while, God had always kind of been saying he was going to draw all the world even the Gentiles, to himself, but that he was going to do it through Jesus Christ. He wasn't going to do it through temple rituals. He wasn't going to do it through the Jewish sacrificial system. He wasn't going to do it through all those things. He himself was going to be the fulfillment of all of those things. He himself was going to be the sacrifice that would bring all of those who have the faith of Abraham. See, this promise that we are inheriting this promise, that we're members together of the same body with the promise. We mentioned before when we went through our previous study that God's promise to Abraham in chapter 12 of, of Genesis, really the rest of the Bible is God working out that promise, that promise to give him a people and a name and a place, God's people. That all the families of the earth would be blessed through f the fulfillment of God's promise and the mystery is that it was Jesus Christ. And the mystery to some of these Jews was they didn't understand. Listen, the Gentiles, now they're a part of this same body. Not a separate family. They're not step cousins. They're not redheaded stepchildren who are out here separate. And we're going to give them some of the benefits. But it really is just for, you know, blood. No, no, no. Paul says there's one body. One body of believers. In a sense, there is one true Israel. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. And humanly speaking, then, all those who are in Christ are members of one people of God. Only ever one people of God. And it now doesn't matter what kind of blood distinction you have. Those distinctions no longer exist. As Paul said in other places, there's no more Jew or Greek. We don't regard people by outward categories anymore. What a good lesson that'd be for all Christians to share with the world. That's the truth of God. That's the truth of unity without uniformity, of genuine diversity, that earthly distinctions and categories are not the way that we're to regard one another anymore. Paul says in 2 Corinthians, I don't regard anybody according to the flesh anymore. I used to do that, but I don't anymore. Now there are the children of God, there are the saved, and there are the lost. And I minister in a, in a special way, and, and I have fellowship with with the saints, right? the communion of saints, that's what it, I have a, a family relationship with the people of God, no matter where they come from, or what they look like, or what they do. That bond now is in Christ. And when I regard others in Christ, it is those outside that family. And to them, I take the gospel. I am salt, I am light, all day, every day, no matter who they are, where they come from. No matter what kind of sin they're bound by, I too was a sinner. I too was bound in those chains. And I'm to be a minister of truth in love. That was the glory of Jesus, wasn't it? That he was full of grace and truth. We don't sacrifice the truth. That's not loving, ultimately. Paul says that love rejoices in the truth. But the truth spoken in love. A grace that says, listen, friend, 
what you're involved in, what you're clinging to, what you want to claim as your identity or your greatest love or whatever it is, that passion, that's an earthly passion that will fade. That's sinful. That's not okay by God's standard. And it doesn't matter whether I like it or not or whether you like it or not. Ultimately, the issue is that we will stand before the bar of God and He will judge. And whether you like Him or not doesn't matter. And whether you believe that He exists or not ultimately does not matter. You will still stand before this judge and He will judge by His standard only. And so don't like it all you want to. You'll still have to account for your measurement by His standard. And so out of love, I'm pleading with you. Call out to God for mercy in the Lord Jesus Christ and Him only. That's the gospel. I don't got to excuse sin, but it's also not my place to tell God to move over on the bench and I'll sit and I'll judge people's sin. Grace and truth mixed perfectly in the Lord Jesus Christ. And to those outside the family of God, our job now is to take the gospel as clearly and as simply and as honestly as we can. Those are the only distinctions that we make. Not black or white, Arab or Israeli, Canadian or American. It doesn't matter. None of those distinctions are distinctions by which God will judge. So neither should we. If we're citizens of the kingdom of heaven, we've got no business separating ourselves, regarding one another, or treating one another differently based on categories that no longer matter under the gospel. That is how we pursue loving and having and enjoying and appreciating this wonderfully and incredibly diverse thing God has made in his image bearers. What an amazing thing it is from the way that we all look, the personalities and passions and pursuits and talents that God's given us to be able to pursue, that we should want all of those things to be focused on the glory of God. All of those things can be used to the glory of God. It's a complete mind shift. and We do much better to operate under this kind of wisdom, this kind of mystery. Look, if you will, or write down, and you can look up later, Romans chapter 15. Just as a Paul did a, did a pretty good job of surveying here some of the things that the Old Testament said. Now, Paul's going to quote in chapter 15. I'm going to read from verse 8 to 12. He's going to give a list of Old Testament citations here. Listen to what Paul brings to light that the Old Testament, that is before the incarnation of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, he says in verse 8, For I tell you that Christ became a servant to the circumcised to show God's truthfulness in order to confirm the promises given to the patriarchs and in order that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy as it is written. So here's where Paul's now going to say, and here's what was written. <clears throat> Therefore, I will praise you among the Gentiles and sing to your name. And again, it is said, rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and let all the peoples extol him. And again, Isaiah says, the root of Jesse will come. Even he who arises to rule the Gentiles, in him will the Gentiles hope. He quotes Samuel. He quotes the Psalms. He quotes Isaiah. It's always been God's plan. And we took some length of time to search the Old Testament scriptures to see how God was constantly pointing to something, someone greater than the ones with whom he was dealing at that time a greater Adam, a greater Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, Moses, Joshua, a greater David, a greater son of David, a greater prophet, a greater priest, a greater king, a greater substitute, a greater sacrifice, a greater savior. We mentioned um, something that Gerhard, Gerhardus Voss had said, or eschatology, that is the final form of all things, precedes soteriology. That the whole matter of salvation really is a working out of God's ultimate plan of the end of all things. God always had the end in mind. He began with the end in mind. God began with the end already in mind. All of that for a greater people, a greater place, a greater rule, a greater blessing for all. The mystery of Christ, the hope of glory, as Paul said, is for all the world. It's more a matter of when 
See, he'd always said that he was going to do this. He would bring that greater prophet. He would bring a savior. He would bring a Messiah. But the mystery really has been about when are you going to do this? And God's left clues for the last 4,000 years prior to this. Types, shadows, prophecies, promises. The idea of, of mystery, the way Paul uses it in the New Testament, is really something that was concealed that's now revealed. This is what God has done at just the right time, he said in Romans, at just the right time, God died for the ungodly. Why was that the right time? God knows. God knows. I don't need to know why that was the right time. God said it was the right time. That's part of his infinite wisdom and insight. So then we come back to this first question. Well, is this God's wisdom or is this the believer's wisdom from God? If it's God's wisdom, then consider this. Consider just how gracious it is that God would, re would redeem a group of vile and wicked, rebellious creatures, knowing fully just how sinful and evil those people were. That God knows all your sin better than you do. And he also knew the cost of the death of the only begotten that it would take to redeem you from that sin. That knowing all of that, he still decided to do that. That the wisdom of God could know your sin and that his choice to be gracious in salvation, which is a free and sovereign choice of God, was made in all wisdom and insight, not arbitrarily, not capriciously, not whimsically, not recklessly, God, in infinite wisdom and insight, decided to do this. What an amazing thing that is. What if this wisdom that Paul's speaking about in the first chapter is really the believers? Consider God's sovereign role in granting a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ to those whom he'd chosen. Look, listen, pardon me, listen for a second to, to Matthew now, this is actually to Jesus speaking in Matthew 11. I'm going to read this in two parts. The first part is Matthew 11:25. 25. This is Jesus speaking. And he's just had this big conversation about these unrepentant cities, these cities to which he went and shared the gospel, and they rejected him. And him telling them that it was going to be better for Sodom on that day because if Sodom had known what they knew, they would have repented. And then he says this in verse 25, and at, at the time Jesus declared, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by the, my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except except the Son and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal Him. Thank you, God, that you've kept the truth from these people who thought they knew it all. That is scandalous. That is a scandalous statement to most people in the modern evangelical church that Jesus Christ is thanking the Father for hiding the truth about who He was from certain groups of people. And that the son gets the choice of who he reveals the father to. <gasps> you could just, and I, the air is sucked out of the room. That's Jesus speaking. He thanks God because in that God was being gracious. Why? We're going to see that God decided that the supreme source and object of, his, of, of the wisdom and knowledge for salvation should be Jesus Christ himself, a source that's not of this world's making or design, that to know Christ is life eternal, salvation, to know God himself, and no other wisdom or knowledge can save or set one free. Listen to what Paul says to the Corinthians. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who's wise? Where's the scribe? Where's the debater of this age? Has, God, has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom. Do you hear that? The wisest thing that God did was make sure that the world could not find Christ on its own. 
that worldly wisdom can't get you salvation. And this, Paul says, is the wisdom of God. It pleased God, for since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Why was God being gracious? Because God wanted to be gracious and merciful, which is necessarily a voluntary thing by the one who gives it. And if you can get there on your own, you don't really need me to give it to you. And if you don't need me to give it to you and you can get it on your own, then really I get maybe some praise if you don't happen to figure it out and I got to help you along. But you get to take some of it for yourself if you figure it out. Have you ever wondered why you hear the gospel and others hear the gospel and you believe and they didn't? Was it because you were wiser? Is it because you're smarter than them? You're more righteous than them? You're more holy? You figured it out. You made the best decision. I get what Billy Graham meant by the 99 and the 1%, but friends, that 1%, that pivotal 1%, that glory belongs to God and not to you. And if you take it for yourself, you're robbing God of the most glory he can have. Because salvation belongs to God and no other. And it's his wisdom to be gracious, to keep that for himself and to reveal it as he sees fit so that he gets all the praise. Furthermore, that saving knowledge of Christ uh, is that a redemption is an act of God's mercy. It's in no way merited by the objects of God's saving grace. That's why he says in Romans 9, it's not of him who runs or who wills, but of God who has mercy. That is how salvation happens. Well, then last, as we, as we end here, how do we apply that? I suggest the first application personally is right there where we left off in 1 Corinthians 1, 26. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. That's what Paul is doing at the beginning of Ephesians. He's boasting in the Lord. Look how gracious God is. God could not be more gracious. He chose those who didn't deserve it. He starts in his introduction of himself. He chose me. God was, Paul was not on a road looking to get saved. He wasn't looking to encounter Jesus. He was looking to kill Christians. And God said, no, you're mine. You don't want to be, but you're going to want to after I do what I do to you. That's how the gospel comes to people. And it's God's choice. Why? So that he gets all the glory and none of his creatures steal his glory. You're not just saved because you're smarter. This wisdom from God produces humility, abounding humility in thankfulness, in gratitude, in praise to God for his graciousness to us because we truly understand that it was the wisdom and the love and the grace and the mercy of God that we even know who Christ is and can see him and can love him. Secondly, our application then to the outside, to the lost and the dying world. Go there into the second chapter. Still there in 1 Corinthians, Paul explains further. He goes, And I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom, for I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. And my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in a demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. What's our application? Preach Christ crucified. You don't got to have a seminary degree to preach Christ crucified. Crucified. You don't have to be the most engaging. You don't have to be the most sophisticated and have all your arguments laid out with technical Latin terms. You don't got to use worldly charm. You don't got to have uh, enthusiastic rhetoric. You don't have to manipulate people with their heartstrings. 
Salvation is the work of the Holy Spirit. As God chooses. And as God has chosen the ends, He's also chosen the means, which is preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. You preach Christ crucified. Christ died to save sinners. And if you would have mercy rather than justice, then you have nothing but to hope in Christ alone. For all your righteousness, for your forgiveness that gets you from in the red to zero, and for His righteousness that gets you from zero to the righteousness that merits the eternal blessing of God. That's it. Christ born, obedient, dead, buried, resurrected, ascended, coming again in judgment. That's it. That's the gospel. That's Christ crucified. Now, should you be able to go deeper and study? Yes. But what it means is, other salvation don't depend on how clever you are. That's more freedom to share the gospel, friends. Not every reason not to, as some would like to claim. Oh, well, if God does it on His own, then we don't need to evangelize. Absolutely not. God says, that's all the reason why you evangelize, because I save sinners. You just take Christ to them. Do it to everyone. All the time. In the church, out of the church. Preach Christ crucified. That's it. Let me do the work of saving. Well, then what about what we do inside the church? And I'll close with this. In Colossians, Paul, if you, if you study Colossians, you, you find that it's very similar to Ephesians. Let me just read for you here. Um, the end of Colossians 1, the beginning of 2, as, as we close. I don't want you to hear what Paul says he is doing, and therefore, in some sense, what we ought to do, what the purpose of this wisdom of God is, is inside the church to encourage growth in Christian maturity. Listen to what he says. I'm in, I'm in Colossians 1, verse 24. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is, the church, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for, for you to make the word of God fully known. The mystery, hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. To them, God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of, his, of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil, struggling with all his energy that he may that he powerfully works within me. For I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not seen me face to face, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and of the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. For though I am absent in body, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and your firmness in Christ. Therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus, the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. There you have it. Why? Inside the, to know more fully, to have hope in the glory to come. As a warning, growing, as encouragement and love and assurance and knowledge of Jesus, discernment against error, to abound in thanksgiving. That's the work of the gospel even inside the church. It grows us inwardly that we don't boast. It promotes sharing the gospel. We become mature in Christ. That is the wisdom of God both in and of Himself and given to the church by the Holy Spirit in the Lord Jesus Christ. The wisdom of God for the people of God. Amen.